So I'm sort of kind of last here at this session, and, and I'm sort of standing in between everyone and, and drinks and food. So, no, no, we're going to keep um, going for at least a minute. I want to inject a little, I want to inject a little culture into this conversation. And as we talk about the reasons that we make interventions in this work, the reason why we advocate for truth in the media, um, and the reason why organizations like mine do that work is for our community, for the folks that we represent. This is my niece and my nephew, Camden and Elon. And, and we do the work because we want the world to look better for them five years or 10 years or 20 years down the line. And, and the work that we do um, at Color of Change, and I'm also going to actually spend some time talking about some work I did prior to Color of Change, is about the truth in how do we, who gets to identify who we are? Who gets to talk about our voice? Who gets to um, define us as people in the media and, and determine the, the names that we're called, the labels that are used to define us? Uh, two and a half years ago, Glenn Beck went on Fox News and called Obama a racist, President Obama racist, with a deep-seated hatred for white people um, and white culture. Uh, Color of Change at that point mobilized over the course of two and a half years over 285,000 of its members um, to get over 300 advertisers to remove its sponsorship, making um, Glenn Beck no longer profitable to Fox News. Um, and it was a victory. It was a victory. It sent a message. But it wasn't necessarily a, a systemic change, right? So shortly after Glenn Beck leaves the air, Eric Bowling replaces him and, and starts talking about why Obama is you know, drinking 40s in Ireland. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about a little bit of work I did um, when I was the senior director of programs at the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Uh, I've been gone from GLAAD for about a year now. But we did a lot of work in terms of terminology and working specifically with the Associated Press in how they define gay and lesbian people. Um, the work started before I got to GLAAD, but it was sort of um, work that took place um, before GLAAD existed and then through um, that's currently being done even today. And it really centers around the word homosexual. Um, in 1973, um, the American Psychological Association removed it from its list of disorders. Uh, it still carried a lot of pathology to it. It was a clinical term, and it was consistently used by folks who opposed uh, freedom for gay and lesbian people. Uh, it's being used over and over and over again by, by opponents to equality for gay and lesbian people or laws that were being advanced around the country. The Washington Post, AP Style Guide, Reuters, and New York Times all sort of listed homosexual as a word that could be used. Uh, and the work really started um, in the 80s uh, by getting the New York Times to just start using the word gay, uh, to just say, start using the word gay along with using the word homosexual. Uh, you know, that, that, that was a victory. Uh, over time, the community started advocating and pushing the Associated Press to start figuring out how they were going to remove the word homosexual from, 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 its, from its style guide, um, listed as a pejorative term. The AP, uh, as they do with sort of a number of terms, says that we don't make that decision at the, at the national level. We really follow the trends that are happening all across the country. And so that's when the community was engaged. Um, community members all around the country were engaged. Every time homosexual appeared in a local AP story and a state a, from a state AP wire, that they would start getting phone calls to change, to change that. And over the course, of about four to five years, um, it got to a point where virtually the word homosexual, you did not see it in any, in any paper sort of across the country, where it got to the point where the Associated Press had to make a decision about what it was going to do next. And so we had a meeting with the Associated Press to sort of look at what we were going to do next about, were they going to keep the word homosexual in and just add gay, where they were going to say, it's, you probably shouldn't use the word, but if you want to use it as a synonym, it's OK. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth over the course of a year. A lot of research was brought in. And they eventually removed the word um, um, homosexual and listed as a pejorative. Um, the work didn't end there. Um, it, actually, it actually sort of intensified at that point. Uh, that's, when, that's when we had to make phone calls every time we saw it come up. That's also when a lot of work was done um, by our opponents to start 
making sure that any time they saw the word gay, they would switch it to the word homosexual. So I have a funny example here of a track runner named uh, Thomas Gay, um, who, <laughs> yes, yes. This comes from the um, American Family Association's Newswire. Um, they take AP stories and they change every time the word gay appears and they change it to homosexual. Um, and so thanks to um, some great staff at GLAAD and some fantastic uh, gay bloggers, we were able to catch this and get a number of screenshots across the internet, not just of Thomas Gay, but of the uh, Boston Celtic NBA player Rudy Gay, oh, who nice. some of you may follow here, um, who's also been Rudy homosexual as well, probably much to the surprise of their family and friends and close associates. Um, it kind of makes for really interesting titles, like Homosexual Eases into 100 Meter Final at Olympic Trials. Um, <laughs> And, um, and probably not what the American Family Association really intended, um, but really shows sort of the power of words and the power that words have in sort of defining a community. We worked um, after that with Gallup and trying to get them to change how they were using the word homosexual in their polling. And they said, we need longitudinal integrity, so we, so we don't want to change the term, the terminology that we're using. We want to be able to compare how folks feel about the homosexual community in 2008 to how they feel about the homosexual community you know, back in you know, 1986. And so we found some polling um, that they did in the 70s around if all things were equal, would you vote for a Negro for president? Um, and they certainly were not using that polling during the Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama primary. Um, and they had made some changes around longitudinal integrity at that point to sort of suit cultural changes and the changes around how we determine how community has agency around who they are and who they're defined, what's actually their truth in the media. Um, and so, you know, those, those changes were made. You know, this is about truth. It's about how folks are defined. It's also about, you know, I know that we've, we, we're having these conversations around, is this a left or right conversation? And so I will be completely transparent. Would you be okay with homosexuals teaching your children versus would you be okay with gays and lesbians teaching your children? Is a 10 point difference? 10 points. But it's also about how the community wants to define how they see themselves, how they should be represented. And so when we think about interventions and as, as organizations like Color of Change or, or GLAAD or organizations that represent community, everyday people that, that want to think about how their children are going to experience the world 10 years or five years down the line, it really is about how do we sort of define and engage media to, to not just look at sort of what we consider as basic facts, but sort of how do our lives, how do our, how is our dignity and how, how are our, how the labels that are used about us represent who we are and, um, and who we should be in the press.